Good morning. <clears throat> I'm not sure if the uh, announcements that I post actually get get read. I posted a a quote for this morning that I'll repeat. It's by my friend David Harris, who has a new book coming out. This is the galleys. Really important writer and thinker, personal hero. But in reading his book, I came across this quote, which I'll enlarge with another quote. Here's what I posted on Facebook. Values that are not embodied in behavior do not exist. Values that are not embodied in behavior do not exist. And then he expands it a little in an essay about the war, the Vietnam War. David went to jail as a draft resistor. He was a football star at Stanford. He resisted the war. In jail, he began the resistance, formed a group resisting in prison, fighting for prison reforms, uh, has lived a tireless life of political engagement. I don't use the word activist. I try never to use the word activist. And the reason is because the word activist was invented by people who are in opposition to my values. If you want to separate people from the broad mass of humanity, you add an IST after their designation, communist, socialist, environmentalist, artist, activist. And the implication is that the normal thing to do, the, the thing that the majority of people do, is nothing about their beliefs. And a small radical subset we call activists acts on them. And I know we've picked the term up just like people picked up the term hippie, which was a term invented by Herb Cain to infantilize and diminish the people who were exploring alternatives in the counterculture. They use it. Black people use the N-word all the time. I don't. I don't use the word activist if I can help it. I'm a person who's engaged in my life. So I could say I'm engaged with the politics of my time. I'm engaged with my neighborhood. I'm engaged with my environment. And I think engagement is the normal state. And by designating people that are representative of a particular state of mind or action, I think we let ourselves off the hook. Oh yeah, she's an activist as some kind of designation of not quite normal. You know, she wears purple sneakers. Here's David's expansion of what he said. We get what we do, nothing more. Especially when lives are on the line. We do not get what we mean to do. Intention is meaningless. Nor do we get what we tell ourselves we do. Appearance counts little and rhetoric even less. We get only the getting, never what we have identified to be got. All means are ends in motion, as ends are means in a static state. Acts that fail to embody their object also fail to realize it. I call this the do theory. The war taught it to me. Values that are not embodied in behavior do not exist. So David is also a Buddhist, serious practitioner. Spent a lot of time thinking about things. 
Now, when he says intention, intentions don't count. He means it in a different way than we Buddhists use it. Buddha, for Buddhists, intention is the only thing in the universe we can control. And so we practice organizing and focusing our intention on kindness, trying to fix it with the force of habit. So that we don't have to think, so that we don't have to have too many rules. If we succeed in fixing our intention on kindness and compassion, we can trust ourselves to be spontaneous and we won't have to worry about leaking envy or jealousy or competitiveness. It's happened to all of us. We say something, we go, oh God, that was a little over the top. Oh, I hope she doesn't take it the wrong way. Uh, it's because maybe our intention was wobbly in that moment. But this is a profound statement. It cuts in a lot of directions. I'm going to read it again. Values that are not embodied in behavior do not exist. <clears throat> we could talk about our country. We could apply it to our country. Values. All men are created equal. If it's not embodied in behavior, it's meaningless. It was certainly meaningless to women for centuries certainly meaningless to slaves, enslaved people, certainly meaningless to Native Americans who were ethnically cleansed, victims of genocide. We can use this lens to look at the f many of the fine speeches in Congress, values that are not embodied in behavior. So in many cases, it seems to me that we begin to substitute ideas for values or ideologies for values. I feel this very often. I, I like to read certain conservative writers, uh, George Will, um, Joan Didion, uh, William Buckley, very, very smart people, very... Um, skilled at writing and my you know my affection as a writer for good writing leads me to honor their clarity and their effort but very often i feel like i'm reading balletic justifications of selfishness and an idea or a political theory is not necessarily a value so one of the things that I was thinking about this week was the way we all talk about the environment. And even the term is misleading because the term implies a dualism. I'm here. The environment is what I'm moving around in. So many times we think, well, if the environment is poisoned, it's going to get me. So it's a kind of, oftentimes, a functional philosophy. But if we look at it in a non-dualistic perspective, which is the Buddhist perspective, really, we are the environment. How can I listen to somebody talking about saving the Amazon and the lungs of the planet who smokes? They don't care about their own lungs and their own body. How can I take them seriously about their declarations for the planet? So I've said this many times. Without oxygen, we don't exist. Without water, without sunlight, without microbes in the soil, without pollinating insects, without the people who plant the cotton, pick, grow the cotton, pick the cotton, weave the cotton, sow the cotton, distribute it. We don't have clothes. When we eat a bowl of rice and some vegetables, 
We're eating the entire world. We're eating the rice paddies, the frogs, the crickets, the people up to their knees in water, planting and picking the rice. So the environment is kind of a misguided term at root. So when we say values that are not embodied in behavior, it can be useful for looking at these things. Now many of our behaviors are adopted. We inherited them. I mean, I inherited the idea of living in a house this large. I inherited the idea of electric lights. I don't have air conditioning, but cars, gasoline, our whole lifestyle is an adaptation. And on some level, we have to acknowledge that the rest of the world can't live this way. There's just not enough planet. There's a little test you can take online where they ask you, you know, how big your house is, how many miles you drive, how many rooms you have, etc., etc. And then it tells you how many planets it would take to, for everyone to live the way we live. So I think I was down between three and four. I was pretty proud of myself. Three and four planets for everyone to live this way. And yet we continue because in many cases we don't know what to do. I've changed all my light bulbs. I drive an electric car that I charge with solar panels. I'm getting battery backups hooked into my house. But those things are expensive and I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford them. I don't have to commute to work. Most of the time I don't work. I do my own work. I write, I think. I take care of my garden and my fruit trees, and my dogs. So on the one hand, we can say that our culture itself is an expression of greed or an expression of indulgence. Makes me uncomfortable. I hate thinking that but it's kind of unavoidable. I've traveled mostly around the world. <clears throat> I've been in for months at a time in third world countries where people have, you know, they sweep a dirt floor, they have no electricity, they have no running water. They seem happy, their life's hard, they struggle, but they're happy. And then I come back to America and it's a shock. People are complaining about wearing masks. What an imposition. The Constitution gives me the right to do whatever I want. What kind of value is that? I mean, if we parse it out, what kind of value is it? So I have a friend who believes the entire pandemic is a hoax misstated, manipulated to get Donald Trump out of office, as if hundreds of millions of people could agree on anything. But my response to him is, well, okay, if you're right, my wearing a mask and keeping you at six feet is a minor imposition. But if you're wrong, you could be killing the people close to you. So why would you elevate an idea, a political idea, an idea that's unsubstantiable? 350 million people all running around doing whatever they want? A kindergartner wouldn't believe that. That's not what freedom is. 
And yet these unexamined words embody values that we don't examine. Like that's not freedom, that's indulgence. And if the pandemic were Ebola, how long would we tolerate somebody breathing into our face without a mask? So when somebody's not wearing a mask, they're putting their own personal beliefs over my safety. Those are the values they're embodying. They may think they're protecting the Constitution or the First Amendment. I don't think the word mask exists in the First Amendment. I don't think the word pandemic. I don't think the word semi-automatic exists in the Constitution. I do think everyone's <laughs> entitled to a flintlock musket, however. So I started thinking about this idea of feeling separate from the environment. And what was it that separated us? And I realized that it's language, it's words. It's from the time we were infants before we knew anything, people were describing the world to us, teaching us how to see the world. And we grew up and we learned to see the world that was described. Oh, look at the birdie. Oh, what cute cheeks he has. Oh, give mommy a kiss. Each of these things embody concepts and ideas. And at a certain point, we can all run them like an unbroken film. And then we can be said to have matriculated into our culture. And different cultures have different films. They all look the same. Pygmy kids at 10 years old in the Aturi forest can recognize 600 species of plants. They know the when, when they're in season. They know what they're used, used for. So walking through the jungle for them must be like walking through my living room. It's a level of intimacy and knowledge and awareness and communication. So one of the big dividers that separates us from the world around us is the idea of what's dead and what's living. We say a rock is dead, but living things grow on it, receive nourishment from it. So in some rudimentary way, I have to think the rock is living. And the idea that things that are inert or aren't human don't count on some level protects us. When I fly on planes, I read these stupid catalogs and you can buy a vacuum to suck up spiders. Now just think about that. The amount of plastic, the amount of electric wiring, the amount of batteries. I mean, if I want to take a spider out of my house, I cover it with a plastic jar and I slide a paper under it and I take it outside. It's not a, uh, it's not a vile and dangerous beast. It's just being a spider. It's just doing what it does. So over the years, I find myself talking to plants. I don't expect that they understand my language, but I think that they have an awareness and I think they can sense my feeling and attitude toward them and I think that's one of the differences between a great gardener which I am not and people who are just moving inert objects around I have uh, women friends who are phenomenal gardeners and they're in relationship with their plants it's not a lesser being. Most indigenous people will tell you that their shamans talk to plants and receive information from their plants. They're quiet enough, they're still enough to communicate with the plants. 
the pygmies walk 600 miles on a journey to find a bush that a grub feeds on. And they take that grub, and that grub makes a poison for their arrows that allows them to kill giraffes and elephants. They have to be very careful with it. They have to do this outside of camp. They have to have covers for their arrows because if a child pricked himself, he or she would die. It's hard to believe that they discovered this by accident, that there wasn't some communication between some shaman or priestess and the plant. And there are incidents of, like, of this all through the natural world. So I'm not suggesting that we need to go out and sing Melancholy Baby to the radishes. But I am saying that unless you can sense the awareness of the world that you move around in, we're never going to get it right. So people like to denigrate that point of view and say, oh God, we got to save the blue skink or the spotted whatever butterfly. We can't build a factory here. Well, maybe you have to consult it. Maybe there's a place nearby that you can do it. But maybe you do have to take its point of view and its needs into accommodation. Because on some level, without all these creatures, the universe that we depend on is not going to exist. We're in the middle of a mass extinction now, unlike anything since the last ice age, since the planet was struck by a meteor that extincted the dinosaurs. So this is not going to be solved just by political speeches and by rhetoric. And one of the things that I noticed, I spent a lot of time with the Hopi people out in Arizona. I try to go to the bean dance every year in February, which is the beginning of their kachina cycle, the sprouting of the bean, the first spark of life. And there's a cycle that goes all through the year. But many years ago, I went to live with an old man named David Benangi, who was a Hopi snake priest. I was in his 90s then. And I went seeking some kind of knowledge, some, some kind of wisdom. And he told me that the Hopis live in such a hard land, it's so difficult, that unless they do the rain dance, they don't have enough rain to water their crops, and that during World War II, when all the young men were taken away to war, it didn't rain between 1942 and 1945 until they came back and they did the rain dance. So I was helping them in a struggle against the Peabody Coal Company out there. The Peabody Coal Company was drilling wells down into the Hopi land and sucking up the aquifer to send pulverized coal to Los Angeles from Arizona, from the four corners of Arizona, using drinking water to send pulverized coal to Los Angeles. It lowered the Hopi wells almost 80 feet, brought the water table down to where they could hardly grow their plants. It was eventually closed down and stopped. But there's two world views right there. There are these simple people that have learned how to, how to live where they are, full, rich, creative, substantial lives, using so much less. The average Hopi, I think, uses five gallons of water a day. I think the average American uses 50. And I'd guess in many cases it's more, if you have a pool, for instance. And somebody looks at this coal and looks at this water and considers it inert and considers the people that depend on it for survival and spiritual sustenance meaningless and steals the water and sends it to Los Angeles, steals it from a reservation, which is a federal trust. So the enemy in that case is a value system. 
and the value that's being embodied in action by the coal company or the people running their air conditioners and keeping their houses at 70 degrees in the desert or growing lawns in the desert or growing golf courses in the desert. The value is some distorted adolescent idea of freedom. I get to do what I want. I get to use whatever's here. I am not in reciprocal relationship with this world. Well, I don't know what, it, what else to call that other than a delusion. The pandemic is certainly demonstrating how delusive that is. The pandemic is feeding on people the way we feed on cattle and pigs. And we are facilitating it with ideas that are criminally stupid. Somehow the Constitution gives us the right not to protect our neighbors, not to make ourselves remotely uncomfortable, not to make ourselves remotely inconvenienced. My dad used to say, Life's hard for the stupid. And one day I said to him, you know, I think the stupid make things hard for everybody else. And yet people are so fixed in their beliefs that they've stopped listening. So this is one of the reasons we meditate. We begin by listening to emptiness. We begin by listening to our spinal telephone. We begin by watching what comes across. We begin by owning our anger, our resentment, our envy, our jealousy, our greed, our affections. And we get so intimate with them that they cease controlling us. That it's more like a horse and a rider or a kayaker on a powerful river. You don't control it, but you can use the energy. So the country is so beset, actually the world is so beset right now, and so paralyzed by the enormity of what we're called upon to do, that it's kind of frozen into inaction. Global warming is going to make the pandemic look like a sissy. And yet, because politicians are dependent on the goodwill of the people, and because it's easier to pander to them than educate them or demand sacrifice, nothing's being done. And the ship of state is heading onto the rocks. I never thought that I would see this level of collapse and ineffectiveness in my country in my lifetime, where we don't have enough paper masks, we don't have enough tests, we don't have enough hospital beds. The other day I reran the speech by Bill Gates in 2013, predicting just this pandemic. And people were preoccupied with busy stuff. So it's not how to say this clearly. I'm a complete supporter of Black Lives Matter. And the reformation of the police so that black communities and black people feel safe and have their rights as citizens and don't fear when they call the police is an immediate priority. It's like the house being on fire. 
it's as vital as the pandemic. But I can already see the dialogue being shrunk so that the dialogue about guaranteeing all American citizens their constitutional rights, which is the real issue, gets diminished into fixing the police. And you can reform every police station in the world, in America certainly. It's not going to stop substandard schools in black neighborhoods, and Mexican neighborhoods. It's not going to stop them getting the most expensive mortgages. It's not going to stop the absence of, ca of capital. It's not going to stop the absence of grocery stores. It's not going to stop the absence of, of pharmacies. Racism is a pandemic. And it depends on white people to end it because black people are 13% of the population. So they need 38% of fellow citizens to stand up and say, we will not tolerate this happening to any citizens. But we all need to be saying this about the planet. We can't trust our legislators. They're not leaders, they're followers. They follow polls. So we have to embody in action our values. We have to put our values in action all the time. And as Buddhists, that has to include the entire universe. Moment after moment, whatever you come in contact with, you try to bring your full awareness to it and react with kindness and understanding and to be open to how it's speaking to you black people, Latin people, fox, a bat, a bird. They all share awareness, plants. So if we love this life, we have to get over the idea that this life is ours. Show me, show me the you. Show me the you it belongs to. Who is this I? Where is it? What color is it? What shape does it have? So if we love life, that's a boundaryless issue. And that means moment after moment after moment, which is all we can do. Whatever we come in contact with, we practice fixing our intention on kindness and compassion, on being aware, being mindful, not to sell better widgets, not to be a better corporate employee, but to be a better being, to be in harmony and in concert with the entire universe, which we do moment after moment after moment. So we need to look at those ideas that separate us from life and death, from self and other, Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal, they're just phantasms. They're just ghosts. The implications of we're all in this together are just that. We get what we do. That's probably enough for today. This prayer that I say comes from, it's called the Metta Prayer. And it's a condensation of a longer piece, which I'll read. Uh, it's kind of a list of behaviors that one who is wise does. And it's kind of a, uh, an urging of a way to act. But for the time being, you're welcome to join me. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. 
May all beings be happy and at peace. Thank you all very much.